So if memory serves, I think I was on asking for group three to come up with their general ideas for how to draw a line here. Um, the motivation for doing this is to say science is something you do. And the ideas that you would have just from common sense very frequently turn out to be some little corner of what we're actually doing. Um, and it also opens up the idea that when you're looking at scatter plots, that you might actually be more than white to look at them. So, so up to this point, we had connect the dots and the symmetric correlation coefficient, or the, the, the factor, first principle factor, that's the distance from each of these dots to a solid line. So we've already hit on a couple of areas. Group three, are, is it the person you nominated to be spokesperson here or maybe a good way to handle this then, since I can't reconstruct the groups because we assigned them at random is just talk about generally three, four and five and I did six groups. What did you come up with? Um, I'm not sure if we have spoken yet, but um, we just <laughs> used the program and found a line of best fit. Good. So, so just, yeah, go we ahead. We let the computer do the thinking for us. Good. So if we're clicking on this, probably what we did was to come over to design and add a chart element like this. And the thing you wanted is the trend line, and here it is. And if you wanted to get even prettier, you'd come down to the trend line and say, hey, more trend line options. And that should let me move some of this over here. Come down to display equation on the chart and maybe display the R square value on the chart. And that gives me these, come here, this little element. And that's teensy tiny because Excel just loves to make things teensy tiny on us. We can come back to the home button and make it big so we can see this like that. Okay, that's good. So, what makes, and, and, and just for completeness's sake, I don't recall if I did this on Friday, but going back to the textbook you had in STAT 1200, they came down here and introduced to you the idea that you can calculate the intercept and the slope of a regression line using these little functions inside of Excel. But to be honest, why would you want to bother with that, given that you can get the regression automatically this way. Well, that kind of leads to the question, what makes that line good? Um, I know Friday we were saying like what made the line good was that it didn't necessarily touch every single point, but it showed the line showed like the median how um, it touched the most points that it could, making the best line that it could. Like it has three on the top and three on the bottom that's not necessarily mm -hmm. touching the line, but it really shows um, the me the median between all of the. Mm -hmm. So our errors of prediction are the same number positive and the same number negative. So that's one property of a regression line. That's good. And I guess the other thing about this is this equation we see up here, the left-hand side, also known as the y predict, that's an equation. We're making a statement 
about why, aren't we? So we're looking at vertical distance and not diagonal distance when we were doing factor analysis and didn't know it. So what, so we, we know that we need to have positive errors of prediction. That is, for example, for this data point, my equation says that you should be here. And the actual score down here is an error. So I guessed what looks like I predicted a two point higher value for this observation for this person than actually occurred. So now we come up to the issue here. If we weren't letting the computer do everything, how would we end up with this line? So say you had a pencil and a very big eraser and a ruler, what would you do? this is right but wouldn't you just try to figure out a line that would touch the most amount of points with it still looking straight mm -hmm. so how would you decide you know so is it the fact that my line touches one two three four five points that makes this best So do we ignore these data points, and just say, well, I only hit five points here. You know, there, there might be another line I can draw that you know, maybe this one, I could draw a line that would hit this one and this one and this one. Maybe I could still kind of sort of hit this one. So my point is, it's not, I'm not drawing the line so that I have the maximum number of zero errors of prediction. You know, it could happen that, you know, I guess if we got really, really picky, you know, this line is actually, this dot is not exactly on the line. And if I made the point smaller, this one is not exactly on the line either. So maybe if you wanted to be really picky, we, we touch this lump, this dot, and this dot. So if you had a ruler and a pencil and an eraser and you drew a line and you used your ruler, how would you go about it? You would want to make it asymmetrical as possible on both sides mm -hmm. well symmetrical in the way of like the same amount of try to get the same amount of points okay. above the line as below the line mm -hmm. yeah. um, okay oh go ahead no go ahead oh, I, I just um and like um yeah you try you want to try to get it to where it's close to some points. But I mean, if if that's not possible, it's just, you just want it to be even on both sides. Yeah. So what you might do, just kind of to use that ruler, I might say, well, I've got a quarter of an inch here, maybe a 16th of an inch here, a third of an inch here, I might, 
use my ruler and, and measure all of these things and draw a line or settle on a line that says, well, if I add up all of these errors of prediction, the line that I've got here gives me the smallest number of mistakes or amount of mistakes in prediction. That's kind of putting a few words in your mouth, but is that kind of the general idea? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So that's also a branch of statistics. You're measuring these errors of prediction in terms of the length. And if you're Googling statistics terms, that's called LAV regression, least absolute values. And that's not the line that you're looking at here. Because the line you're looking at here minimizes the squared distance from of the data from the predicted regression line. That's why if you look in a textbook about this particular regression line, it's called a least squares regression line. So there's a couple of nice things about that. First of all, the reason we don't do least absolute values regression in the stat 1200 or in psychology generally is computationally, it's a lot of work. Your computer has to spend a lot of time drawing candidate lines and then kind of agreeing, okay, this is my best line. <clears throat> The reason that you learned about regression in STAT 1200 and here is least squares is very easy to calculate. It goes all the way back to Friedrich Gauss. And it has a least squares regression have a nice relationship with our old friend, the normal distribution. So that, in a nutshell, is what this line is, what the computer was doing when you let it do the drawing for you. And this R square is the proportion of variance in the criterion explained by the predictor. So if I took the square root, of 0. 0.6666. I get 82. And that's the correlation coefficient. The reason in regression that you talk about it, R squares, is you get a number that goes from 0 to 1. And if you have a 1, you've explained everything. And if you have a 0. 0.5 R squared, you've explained about half of the variance. So another nice way to think about this, each of these points, that's the predicted value, that is here and here and here and here and here and here. In other words, the, on the x-axis where a data point happens, on this line, that's why predict. That's the predict, your prediction of what you think the criterion is going to be. For each of the data points in my study, I'll have a pre predicted score. And the variance of my predicted scores divided by the variance of my actual scores, these things, is going to be the R square. Oh, you know. One of the things that is scary about a statistics class when you're taking it is, oh my gosh, I really hate it, first of all. And secondly, when you take a statistics class, maybe I'm going to miss something and then I won't understand anything after. So it's, a, it's good to talk a little bit as a group 
Is what I'm saying making sense? Could you try explaining it one more time? You betcha. Maybe it's helpful to do this with, I've got a chat here, darn it. I'm pretty lost. Thank you. Okay. So maybe this helps. Here we have our X values and here we have our Y values. So we can see that Y goes from 4.26, that's this little point, and it goes all the way up to this point up here. So that's gotta be the 10.84. I could calculate the variance of this variable. So Okay, like that. Now, I also got this handy dandy equation here for, you know, if you want to actually calculate it the way they taught you in STAT 1200, there's your equation. So for each of these things, each of these observations, I can say, I have a prediction about the criterion. Okay, I can make that comment in a minute. So, for each of these observations, I can say equals my intercept plus the slope, which is this number, times the x value. So for this person who had a score of 10 on the predictor, I'm predicting that that person is going to have an eight. And I can repeat this process for everybody in my data set. So I can copy this and do this. So here I have some predicted Y scores. And for this first person, I predict an A. For the person who had A on the X value, I predict a seven. We actually got 6.95. For the person who had a 13 on the predictor, that's over here, that's this person, didn't do so hot. We actually observed in the data 7.58, this thing right here. But we predicted 9.5. We predicted, let's see, that's the 13, this value right here. So these numbers are my predictions. This is the data that happened. I can calculate a variance of these numbers, my predictions. And the R square is gonna be the variance of my predictions divided by the observed variance. Ta -da. So let me come back here and see if I can get some more chats here. All right, so someone says, I don't know what we're supposed to be getting from this. Like what makes this a good line? Well, the point, the point is, this regression line is the best answer. It's, this is the unique line. There's only one line that I can draw through these data points. 
that's going to give me an R square of 0.6665. Any other line I draw is going to have a smaller R square. Any other line is going to be worse, worse than what line I'm drawing here. So that's what makes this the best line. Now, to be honest, in STAT 1200, they should have taken the time to tell you this. But we're going to say it again here because it's important. And regression lines are what we draw in order to make the best possible prediction about behavior. More questions? So the takeaways on this are what makes this a good line is it has something to do with errors of prediction of the criterion. It's not the distance, that's factor analysis. I teach a graduate class and that stuff. That's a different kettle of fish. But it's also minimizing the squared distance. And what makes least squares lines the best is they have the maximum R square. That is, they have the maximum ratio of the predicted scores divided by the observed scores. Anybody else kind of have something you were playing with? I, mean, I do this since I've been teaching graduate statistics for 31 years now. Um, people have in the past come up with different things. So kind of I, where we get the predicted scores from. The predicted scores come from our equation. So what I'm doing is I'm taking this person's X score. That is, this person here has an X score of 10. So 10 times 0 0.5001 plus this intercept value of three. So the intercept is the same for everybody. And the predicted score is 0.5 times their predictor score. Is that good? Person who asked the question, tell me yes. He said that I'm gonna keep on talking. Uh, no. <laughs> okay. Hmm. So I understand how you use the equation, but how did you get the equation? Is that, do we just have to use the, the software to get it? Magic, yep. I mean, I think, and this, this is just me, but there really isn't any point to learning the equation mathematically. The computer gives it to you. I mean, for those of you who maybe have had some matrix algebra, X prime X inverse X prime Y gives you your regression weights and you then multiply those by this vector. But you know, for you, you, for the class, generally at this point in time, there's these things called computers, they give you an equation, but you need to know, visually in terms of a scatter plot, what's that equation doing for you? Is that good enough? Hmm. 
Well, I'll riff a little bit on other ways that people have drawn lines. Sometimes people say, drawn a line, fine. I'm gonna take this lowest point here, <clears throat> this highest point here, connect the dots, draw the line, be done. Well, you can see that's not gonna be terribly helpful for being the best line because you know there might be some measurement error going around in the first or the last data point. But you know, if you do decide to take a course in theoretical statistics, they spend some time telling you why that's not going to work or not be as good as the least squares line. But it's another thing, it exists. Sometimes people will say, oh, I'm going to look at the horizontal line and minimize the square distances there. Well, you're treating the predictor variable like it's the criterion. You'll get a slightly different line if you minimize this horizontal distance than the vertical distance in a regression. So where, I'm still puzzling over how to say where do we get the predicted scores from. So <clears throat> let's close it with an example. Let's say, let's say our predictor is how many minutes you spent doing the inquisitive exam, inquisitive exercise on let's say the first chapter and these are minutes but what you want to do is you want to say can i take inquisitive scores and use that to predict my performance on the first test or a quiz so i would get some minutes and i get some scores and I'd look at the scatter plot and I draw the regression line. So for this person who spent 10 minutes, they got a score of eight on the test. From my data here, that is all these numbers, I'll calculate this trend line. And that trend line gives me this equation. And this equation in words says, I predict for this first person that their score is going to end up being 0.5 times 10 plus three. And that's how I got that eight. And where did I get the 0.5 or three? Well, I could just type in 0.5 or the number three, I went downstairs here and used the way they taught you in STAT 1200 to get those two numbers. I could just as easily have typed in the number three plus 0.5001. Gives me the same number. Does that, is that, where the question came from, you didn't know what those cells were. So now I want to move to using a scatter plot to think critically about a claim. So let's say you write to Dr. Morling and you say, Is it really just simply good if I replicate a study? Should I be confident? And what I would like to do is to tell you a little story. Say I gathered some data sets, I replicated my study four times, and each time I did my study, I got exactly 
the equation y equals 0.5 times the predictor plus three. And I got an R square of exactly 0.6665. That is, I observed the correlation of 0.81. Should I now think that the phenomenon I'm looking at is strong, my theory is good, I should believe this study because I replicated it four times. Hmm. Well, in the case of this first data set, yeah, okay, it looks like I've got a, a line. I don't see anything wrong. But let's turn now to our second study. And you can get to that by in your Excel spreadsheet, clicking on study two. Well, if I make a scatter plot, look at that. It doesn't look like the first one, does it? God is telling me pretty clearly in the scatter plot, this is a curvilinear relationship. So if I'm coming into here and I come into the design, and I add a chart element. Yeah, I get the same old straight line with the same old regression. So I can say display the equation and give me the R square. And there it is, and it's teeny tiny script again. So we'll make the thing bigger. same old numbers. So unless you either did a sophisticated analysis that would tell you, or you use the eyes God gave you with a scatter plot, you wouldn't know that this correlation here <clears throat> leaves money on the table, kind of, that my mistake in thinking that the correlation, square correlation was only 0.66, was I didn't consider another trend line. So I'll come back over here and say, the trend line that I really, really want is a quadratic one. I don't think I get to draw that here. Nope, I don't think quadratics are an option for me. But if I drew, if I made my regression equation, y equals something times x squared plus something times x plus a constant, I could draw a curved line that would go through all these data points perfectly. And I would explain all of the variance because all of my predicted y's would hit all of my actual y's and the ratio of the variance of y's, y predicts to y's would be one. Hmm. Well, let's consider study three. What happened? Here I've got data points, everybody's falling on a straight line. Yeah, everybody's out of step, but my son, Johnny, there's this one data point out here that's way the hell and gone from the predicted values that you'd have based on everybody else. Well, what happened? My linear trend line here got pulled up because I had this person here. So if I were sampling this data set and I did my study based on these people, it's probably the case if I repeated my study, I'd have an R square of one, except for this person who did something evil, they gave me a slope value that's different 
than the slope value for everybody else. This person, this problematic, atypical person has a name in statistics. It's called an influential observation. Just make that big enough. And we won't do it in this class, but when you take another class someday, looking for influential observations is part of being skeptical about a regression. Is that making sense? There's a little bit of a term of art that occurs to me, so let's talk about that now. When we go back to study two, and we say drawing a straight line is wrong, I should be drawing a curved line. The word in statistics for that is functional relationship. So for example, you would say the functional relationship between X and Y is not linear, the functional relationship is curvilinear. And the second thing, an influential observation, the presence of an influential observation is someone who causes me to get a different slope or possibly different intercept than I otherwise would have observed had I not had that person or a small group of people in the study. Well, what's an example of an influential observation? At Mizzou, in my life, looking at alcohol use, white, first generation, that is, first person in their family to go to college, uh, somewhat rural males are really at a high risk for problematic alcohol involvement in college. The 30 individuals in the freshman class, the last time we surveyed all of the freshmen at Mizzou, those 30 people were responsible for all of the 20 plus drinks in a sitting. And surprise, they don't do well in school. They're also most of the energy behind the relationship between alcohol use and at poor academic performance. Now, if we didn't have those people here, we would have a well, you, you wouldn't be able to do many grants with the federal government on the, the bad effects of alcohol. Fraternities, sororities also do their thing, but you know, that's kind of an issue, side issue. This influential observation can also be called an outlier. An outlier is somebody who causes you to have more errors of prediction than you otherwise would have. So if I didn't have this person here, I would have no errors of prediction. So this person is influential. They cause me to observe a slope that's different. And they're also an outlier because they cause me to have more errors of prediction than I would otherwise have. So if we come into our data and we find the person 13, 
and we remove them from the data with the delete key. Ta da! It doesn't update my equation here. Come on. All of my data points are falling in a straight line. If I come into the design and I put my new trend line on, everything is there. If I come in and I put my equation in, I get a new equation and an R square of one. Okay. So I have one more magic trick to show you. What about study number four? Oh my gosh, look at this. The variance of my X values, these people and that person is the same. It's just that now everybody's down here and this one person who has a different X value than everybody else is steering my entire regression line. So this person is a very influential, influential observation. If this person would have scored 10, the regression line would have gone here and connected everything else. You know, that's, again, these are some things that can go wrong. So this is an example of an influential observation. And in this case, you know, the errors of prediction aren't really affected because all of the errors of prediction in the data are here. So this person is not an outlier. They're just influential. Well, what does this tell us? It tells us that in the book and in psychology articles, when you read them, you could be skeptical about the statistics that are reported. You need to assume that the researcher has taken care to look at their data and think about what could go wrong. And they may not have done this. So this is a concrete explanation of why in the book, she talks about the fact that having the data available for other people to look at is really a key to being a skeptical scientist. Now, I'm aware that this is a lot of work. What I wanted to accomplish is it makes some sense to go back and rehearse some of the things you have had in STAT 1200, mainly because it's been a bit of time and the message may not have even been sent very well. I mean, I've, I've got the book here, I've read it, but I thought it was important to say some of the take home messages from the curriculum are lines are a line of best fit, they minimize the squared errors of prediction, the ratio of predicted scores to observed scores is called the R square. If we talk a little bit more about the language, some people talk about that as the coefficient of de determination. But th that's exactly what they mean. They don't mean anything other than R square. So any questions, gang?
Um, so if I wanted to summarize kind of like the couple of, of graphs and stuff that you just showed us, I would say mm -hmm. like, so what you're showing us here is that if a statistician was only looking at like the computer numbers that, that the computer is producing, mm -hmm. then it would look like this is a really good stable thing that they're researching. Mm -hmm. But in fact, there's different, um, there's different ways you can get the same number and it, they don't mean the same thing. Exactly, yes. Uh, you know, you might say study one, two, three, and four might be different populations of people. You know, maybe just to make something up, maybe this first study was a random sample of college freshmen, and the second one was a study of people who are first generation college students. Well, by just looking at that regression line and the R square and the significance level of that, you may have missed the fact that, that there's really two phenomena going on here that for these first generation college students, there's a curvilinear relationship. And for the rest of us, there's a linear one. And, you know, part of being skeptical is being skeptical about this equation. And a scatter plot can help you be skeptical. And I think, again, this is kind of a curricular thing in SAT 1200 and in the book. They say, oh, well, we'll, we'll make you a scatter plot. And for you, you can you know, visualize it because you just don't have the intellectual ability to handle my wonderful equation when really, Thinking about your data as a scatter plot is an important and valid way to criticize your study every bit as much as the statistical significance test that results from a regression line. I see we're at time here. I broadcast on Canvas that I would like you to finish the Inquisitive by Thursday. Uh, and that's on the calendar on Canvas. Um, on Wednesday, I'm going to start talking about ethical guidelines for psychology research. I have office hours now, and I'm happy to keep on talking. If you want to hang around, we can certainly come back and revisit what I was talking about here.